Hope Rugo, a professor of medicine and director of breast oncology and clinical trials education at the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Center. We're gonna talk about some interesting updates from ASCO 2021. And with me today are my excellent uh, colleagues, very knowledgeable and key opinion leaders in breast cancer, Dr. Jennifer Litton, who's professor of medicine and vice president of clinical research at MD Anderson's Comprehensive Cancer Center, and Dr. Bill Gratishar, who's professor of medicine and chief of hematology oncology at Northwestern University. Okay, so now we're gonna discuss some uh, areas that were uh, presented, some new areas that were presented at uh, ASCO this year that focused on triple negative breast cancer. And again, you know, this is an area that's such a challenge for us in trying to figure out the right way to treat patients with early stage disease uh, to try to improve outcomes, since we know that outcome is so poor in the metastatic setting. Um, and then there were some uh, additional data presented on new agents and some uh, further subset analyses of uh, already presented data that I think are useful to discuss as well. But we'll start with the immunotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting. Uh, we know that Keynote 522 has had a press release uh, very recently noting that they met their event-free survival endpoint in patients who received a year of pembrolizumab versus those who received a placebo along with standard neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, but we also know that there's some toxicity that continues uh, in the post-neoadjuvant setting in patients who receive checkpoint inhibitors. And occasionally those can even be uh, fatal in certain situations. So there's a lot of interest in what checkpoint inhibitors do. There also was a little bit of data presented at the FDA's ODAC meeting from Keynote 522 that suggested that giving pembrolizumab after surgery might have a positive impact even in patients who didn't achieve a PCR. We learned something new from Jepar Nuevo, a phase two trial from the German breast group um, about use of checkpoint inhibitors and these particular endpoints. Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about what Sibylla Loibo presented? Sure, absolutely. So I think that Gepard Nuevo was, um, uh, you know, a study of his 174 patients who received um, napaclitaxel and dervalimab followed by uh, anthracycline-based chemotherapy with epirubicin and dervalimab and then went to surgery. And, and it had already presented just like the Impassion, you know, O31 and the Keynote 522 showing some improvement in PCR. And, and you know, that had been 44.2 to 53.4% improvement. And what this did was actually looked at a median follow-up at 43.7 months and showed that question that everyone's asking for the use of immunotherapy, what about those longer term survival curves? So the three-year um, invasive disease-free disease survival improved from 77.2 to 85.6, the distant disease-free from 78.4 to 91.7, and they're seeing a separation in the overall survival from 83.5 to 95.2%. And I think that this comes into a lot of the questions that we really have around endpoints for preoperative chemotherapy or preoperative systemic therapy trials. What is the delta and pathologic complete response that matters? And I think that this also shows us with that, that when we're thinking about immunotherapy, the delta and PCR isn't the whole story. And seeing that uh, bigger separation that we're seeing on the back end of it is something we're gonna really need to think about as we're structuring these trials for these endpoints. Now, I thought this was really interesting. It's important to keep in mind that this was a phase two trial with less than 200 patients and 35% had stage one disease. And in fact, although numerically, as you uh, nicely summarized, the PCR rate was higher, it didn't meet statistical significance in that trial. Probably, I'm guessing, because there were uh, a fair number of stage one patients who had no clinically no negative disease. Uh, but just with that treatment in the preoperative setting, they did show a big difference. Now, we have seen, in fact, that phase two trials that show EFS benefits don't necessarily translate into benefit in the phase three setting. But the big question, as you pointed out, is 
do you really need to give the checkpoint inhibitor for a whole year? You know, we still haven't really figured that out for HER2 positive disease and trastuzumab, no. <laughs> never will. So I think, you know, that's, that's really the biggest issue. And if you give a checkpoint inhibitor and somebody doesn't have a PCR, are you still really improving outcome in a clinically significant way? What was your take on that data bill and how would that affect your use of checkpoint inhibitors if Keynote 522 results in approval of pembrolizumab? Well, you know, I think that all of this stuff is intriguing, but, um, you know, Jepar Nuevo falls in line with what the other trials showed with respect to PCR, but where it, it, it shines a bit is with the longer term follow up. So, again, it's a smaller trial, but nonetheless, I think. Uh, you know, it's consistent in a sense with that. Now, are we using checkpoint inhibitors routinely preoperatively? We are not. And I still agree that we should not be doing that routinely. But I think we will get there. We just need longer follow-up in some of these trials. If um, Keynote 522 as a 12, almost 1,200 patient study shows a clinically important, not just statistically significant, but the p-values are a lot to reach their significance. Um, if it shows a clinically important difference in EFS, uh, do you think then you'll be giving patients with triple negative disease a year of pembrolizumab? Yeah, I think we would consider it strongly in that setting. I don't know about you, I would. Yeah, I think we all will. John? Yeah, I definitely would. You know, I think that um, I still I still am left with the same problem with triple negative breast cancer where, you know, so many of the people will do so well with a full pathologic complete response with very little. I hoped that this is the end of the days of let's throw all patients with triple negative breast cancer in the same study with one drug. Um, it's one of the reasons, you know, I do love iSpy and other kind of uh, uh, platforms that try to individualize therapy here um, because A, I think that we could be minimizing a bigger effect for a group of people who really need this and that we're certainly going to be exposing a lot of people to the long-term toxicity of immunotherapy that can be lifelong like the endocrinopathies and they would have been cured completely at, with polychemotherapy alone and maybe even less of that. So um, I think that we will absolutely, if the keynote is positive, we'll be doing it, but I really think we need to be more thoughtful of how we're gonna figure out who really needs this or not. And I, and yeah. I think, you know, even though it's not directly germane, Leisha Ammon's uh, presentation about looking at the different markers really, in my mind, uh, highlighted how early days we are in trying to figure this out because, you know, it was, it was very interesting, but if I had to go explain it to somebody and how you're going to use it in clinic, you can't. So I think we're really at early days about trying to distinguish these patients yet. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's going to be interesting. Clearly the benefit was greater in node positive versus node negative disease. But I think the question for us based on the combination of these data sets is if somebody has a PCR, do you stop at the time of surgery that, and do you give this to node negative disease? But we'll see. Um, in we our do last have the, oh, I'm so sorry. We do have the SWOG 1418 that's rounding the corner of ending soon at some point. Um, looking at just purely, you know, the year of pembrolizumab for high risk uh, patients with triple negative breast cancer. You know, I think that we'll get some more information there. Um, the data of giving it with during the adjuvant radiation is still, I think, multiple studies that are accruing and reporting are going to give us more information on that. And I think that, you know, we're still so early, like you said, hope on I, I don't think this is where we're going to end with this. I think we've got a lot of refining to do. Yes, I mean, the, the SWOG trial that uh, Jennifer's me mentioning looked at patients specifically who have residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy. Some will have received Cape cytobine, et cetera. So I think that that will provide us with some really important data about whether or not you need to give this preoperatively. My bias is that you probably do because you need the chemotherapy interaction and that that's gonna be really important, but uh, we'll find out in over time, a really important trial. Um, in just a, uh, the last less than a minute or so, uh, Jen, do you wanna briefly talk about 
uh, the antibody drug conjugates we're using for metastatic triple negative breast cancer, sasetizumab, govitecan had some updated data. And then there was an interesting, um, actually similar uh, trope to uh, targeted ADC that uses an exatecan uh, derivative, uh, deruxtecan, similar to trastuzumab deruxtecan called DATO DXT or DATO POTUMAB uh, as a, and it just presented some phase one data. Yeah, you know, I do think that the antibody drug conjugates are such uh, uh, an exciting new group of um, drugs. Sasituzumab has now become a, a staple in my uh, uh, drug usage for um, patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And, and I have definitely had patients have significant response in that third line setting, which isn't something we've, you know, seen routinely for a while. So um, I think that, um, you know, overall hope, I think that there are so many different drugs in, in uh, development. I think they're getting smarter. I think they're getting more targeted. I'm very excited about them. I think that these um, other, the, the dual antibody and the fusion proteins um, are also going to be where we're going uh, in the next five years. So we can really look at multiple targets at the same time. Yeah, I agree. I think it's exciting and seeing that you can give sasetizumab in the second line setting in older patients with similar results, seeing that there's a new ADC uh, with the same antibody also is great. Maybe sequential therapy will be good. And of course, we're waiting for data using these agents in hormone receptor positive disease. The tropic trial with sasetizumab has completed accrual. So hopefully we'll see that data next year along with the trastuzumab deruxtecan and HER2 low. Uh, we just saw a press release for SID985 meeting its endpoint in HER2 positive disease um, in the metastatic setting. So I think that uh, we have lots of uh, new data to see in the near future. Thanks both of you for your excellent comments and discussion of this exciting area.